Hi, welcome to this Open Security Summit session in April 2023. And we have Chen here, which is going to expand on why Shift Left isn't what you expected. And we already had uh, some interesting conversations before, and we're looking forward to see where Chen is taking this from. Over to you, Chen. All right, thank you very much for having me. Um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this uh, subject here. Um, so I'm Chen, I'm, uh, I live in Tel Aviv. I'm a co-founder and chief architect of uh, Enzo Security. Um, my passion is around building things, uh, but uh, professionally I've been more busy with uh, breaking them for, I guess, the beginning of my career I was a pen tester for many years. And then that led, led me to take more and more interest in the side of software engineering. And I think the second half is more about engineering, cyber solutions, um, and so I can still be active on these uh, two realms. Um, what we're building at Tenzo is an ASPM solution. And we are building it to allow sustainable and scalable AppSec by um, working on, on uh, uh, building all the bits and pieces that are necessary to uh, be able to list all your assets. And then also in the same way to list all your controls and get some feedback on the status that you have in each control so you can handle and focus on the critical alerts. And uh, this is a very interesting experience to build this kind of uh, innovative uh, um, application, but it, it takes us into places that we need to really think about how this is done and what's inside in application security as a, as a, as a realm, what's going on inside, so many frameworks, so many ways to approach the problem and think about it. Um, so naturally, because our, our um, flow is to list an asset and then understand the controls and then measure the controls, uh, defense metrics approach is very relevant um, to, to adopt as a way of thinking about this. Um, this is uh, some of the work of one of our advisors, uh, Sonny Liu, uh, and it's about um, thinking about uh, the problem in a way that um, you use NIST security function uh, and then list down the, the areas of, um, of technology that you have, and here application we are here in this tier, and then you think of how to combine the right combination of technology, people, and processes in a way that will allow you to make sure that you're covered in each and every one of these activities. Uh, or these functions of security. This approach is, is very, very so systematic, uh, and this is why we at Enzo, we, we relate to it very much. It, uh, it builds on a, on a well-adapted um, structure of a NIST um, security functions framework. And then you also drill down on each area, and you think you have three tools at hand, and it's always the, a solution, a technology, a process that you can try to uh, adapt throughout the organization, and the people that you can operate uh, within it when, when each and every one of them have the, the pros and cons. Uh, building too much on process can, can create antagonism and can break down in different places. You don't have enough people to do all of the tasks and your technology is not able to do some of the tasks. So the, the right combination and the right uh, visibility into your defense metrics is, a, is an approach that we attend so we really like to, um, to include in our um, process of thinking. We are playing with it a little bit because in application security, and the, the identify, detect, protect uh, convention of, um, of uh, NIST sometimes is a little bit challenging to adapt, to apply directly to everything that we do. Um, so we're always busy with it. We are mapping it. We, we have this uh, open project, the AppSec map, and uh, vendors can subscribe, uh, can pub, uh, submit their solutions, and then we list the solutions. We give a little bit of information about each solution, let you also see what kind of vendors have, and also open source tools inside. But the main purpose of this is to help to assist um, everybody in the community in understanding this landscape of application security. You can also uh, kind of a tiny tool to build your own map and and then see what kind of things you can have for infrastructure as code security, what, what kind of things are, are out there, and also open source solutions, we, and, and then kind of try to lay down the things that you're doing to have another, another um, um, perspective on this. Um, and, the, and in the process of building all the, this database of all, all this knowledge um, here at Enzo, we face a lot of discussion about um, how things should be done, why things should be done, um, what is the best approach, what kind of uh, frameworks we have and what is the other differences. Um, and also about things that are more like a, a trend or, or an approach that is even 
why they like shift left and we get to this discussion a lot and what does it mean exactly and how to do it is it devsecops or not what what is it like what what's inside exactly but we are very consistent uh, in our approach to try and map a good defense matrix and um, so if we go down a little a little bit uh, we dive a little bit deeper into this question we can already start to break it down also from the threat perspective uh, realize the full threat and then this gives us an idea on, on what kind of assets should be under the jurisdiction of AppSec. Um, so here is just a simplified uh, top level um, stride approach to all the things that make up your full application stacks in again in very high level but when you think about a um, tampering related problem so you need to consider your CI CD pipelines themselves the external supply chain the internal supply chain and then also the instrumentation and everything that is uh, that is actually operating your application all these are under the risk of tampering and you as a as application security function you have to think of of fortifying this threat fortifying your um, your assets from the threat of tampering across the stack and this is what makes it so complicated we break it down to actual activities in the NIST security function domains we can we already have some more familiar names uh, for those of us who are not um, doing stride every morning and um, so we already see categories of tools and how they help in breaking this down um, <clears throat> all this is something that happens every day in every company that exercises application security and then all of a sudden there is this okay we need to shift left we need to try and shift left the same way that developers shifted left uh, testing um, so who does this this is our uh, generally speaking our team we have we have the um, uh, leaders of the team usually it's the manager and and, and their architects um, they are about building up some protection into the environment and um, um, including the right processes for uh, for validation for testing that is not a uh, part of what we today most uh, teams do as part of their DevSecOps gig not all of them but uh, on the other side of the uh, of the architects that are into the content understand the application to its logic and to its business logic functions and then help build up the right protection around it and within it and the right processes to validate it we also have today a growing trend of DevSecOps and DevSecOps, we have instrumentation, a lot of uh, testing tools to cover up for a lot of the identify or vulnerability identification process. And, and then we get, we get asked in all this, what is shift left? Who is doing this out of this team? Is it something that someone else do? Is it part of, is, is it, uh, should the uh, developers own it? Uh, what part of it should developers own? Who is the owner in general? Um, and this is what this talk is about. Um, we're going to talk about what is it, a perspective, a wide perspective on what shift left is. Um, just looking at different perspective of shift left, not necessarily in security and, and what was the impact of it. And um, I think we will drill down a little bit into the discussion on, on um, how does it look today in application security and, and we'll wrap up with uh, some sort of a uh, discussion on things that maybe we should consider as first easier and more impactful steps to shift left and to uh, um, inspire a shift left movement for security inside an organization. Um, so what is it? If we think about the DevSecOps as a, the DevOps as a, as, a, as a delivery model or a framework to think about, a way to think about how, um, how the software uh, factory works, uh, the software work, factory works in, in phases where we, from the moment uh, something is, a, is in the um, ideation phase up to the level that it's been operated and, and been kept operated and maintained in production. And then usually it feeds back into evolution of the software, start to add a new feature or fix a problem and go all the way back in, until this problem is operated. And, and the infinity loop was already something that we are all familiar with. Um, and shift left is, if you think about this loop and you spread it on one long line, the left is the start that start the, the, the side that starts from, from the developers, from the create phase of, of the story. And the right hand most side is the right, the, where things are operated. 
Uh, things are already in production, things are already materialized into something that is part of our business, part of our uh, dependency chain, and it's harder to move. Um, and in the, in, here is the beginning, here is the genesis of all software. It starts from someone has an idea and then wrote some code. Um, and, and shift left is about moving things here because then it will be a little bit easier to control the evolution and and fix problem before they get into a place where it's a bit it's a, it's a bit harder to get rid of what kind of things we can shift left so if you think about this as a broader term not only security uh, shift left security but a broader term we can the create is on the leftmost side you can't shift it more to the left because it's already at the left um, testing and security testing uh, can be in the intermediate uh, side. It can be pushed as much as possible to the left, and then the rest of the of the flow is alleviated from those tasks to a point. And then um, something that is maybe not all the, not uh, usually conceived as a shift left activity, but all the effort of describing uh, elements of your deployment in terms of uh, the actual artifacts, but also the the uh, topology and the way that your uh, production environment operates and, commu and uh, artifacts communicate with each other, this effort is has been greatly pushed to the left with uh, infrastructure has got um, approaches in the last few years and had a tremendous effect. And this is definitely something that can be decided, that an organization can decide that they expect that uh, part of, of, um, of activity that is about um, taking a code and preparing it for uh, operation in production, it can be pushed to the left and be done by developers. Um, what, are the, what is the motivation? So the motivation, as I said before, is everything starts from the code, is everything starts from this moment in time that someone had an idea in an in a enterprise environment, this idea is is a little bit different maybe than in your basement, but still it's the same thing that you have some sort of an idea and then you build up a plan and start building it and all you need is a computer and an IDE and you can start code it. Um, and every every piece of software that we're using um, started from there. And the idea of, of, of bringing more and more to this point in time is about saving time later. Later things get more complicated Things get more convoluted in, in one another and it's a bit more difficult to spot and, and uh, fix. Um, and um, <clears throat> the, uh, the actual um, things that you shift left, uh, things that we touched before, is that to make testing something that developers are in charge of kind of um, by the book. Testing is core activity for developers and they test with code, they write code to test their code, um, which always give some sort of a paradox kind of question, like who tests the tests. Um, but uh, this is already a standard and everybody is, uh, is doing this. Um, and also packaging and, and building up the, the artifact, the containers and all, and all the information for further um, integration and deployment is already also being adapted as a, as a standard. Um, and these are the kind of things that we can uh, shift left. And when when we dive in a little bit more, let's let's try to look this in the, in the eye and and answer is it is it useful for us? If you are looking at your um, end of uh, end of the year uh, performance report for your engineering organization and or for even for even larger than that, even for the full company, um, it is, I think, something that uh, many managers um, face is this question, am, am I running the, leading the right balance between investing in infrastructure, making things more, investing in velocity, making things running, run um, faster in most cases, but still stopping and investing in some kind of an infrastructure, or should I keep just building uh, the same way I do? Is this process right? Is it slowing me down? So... Things that that in, uh, part of the decision making that is inspired by uh, a thinking that we should shift left activity to save time later, um, not all of it is uh, is successful in the same level. So if you think about um, containerization uh, or any other type of packaging, I think that uh, it speaks for itself when we look at uh, at all these uh, uh, public and private. Uh, 
repositories of artifacts and uh, amazing array of uh, possibilities to orchestrate them into an operating um, production applications, I think that we can definitely say that the um, approach of moving part of that job to the hands of the developers, to the beginning of the uh, of the plan has been very, very successful and everybody that practices it is very happy with the results and the impact that it has on their velocity. Um, uh, Infosasha has got the same way. Maybe you can even kind of think about it together. It's maybe one, um, one thing with two faces. Um, and then another thing that uh, we find very, very successful uh, because because it is, is is not necessarily critical, but it adds a lot of value and it's not hard to accomplish, is attribution. Attribution or the developers attribute facts or, uh, or, or simply who they are, uh, for example, using uh, code owners. Uh, this is, um, this is another, um, um, uh, an approach that is very useful and has a lot of impact on the visibility that the organization has into artifact, into uh, the code, into what's happening, and the, the, it greatly improves the ability to lead a good uh, response um, um, practices. And so instead the response become faster and more effective uh, and uh, visibility in general is uh, is improved and it's a great uh, supporting um, asset for organization that is living, breathing actual production and needs to um, to adapt to things that has happen uh, in real time. <clears throat> things that are a little less successful, I'd say, maybe maybe it's a bit uh, dangerous we feel um, we, we, it's a bit risky to say because uh, a lot of people are, are uh, advocating uh, patterns like uh, TDD and uh, extensive use of uh, testing. And of course, uh, this is something that is is a must have for every organization that wants to uh, lead a healthy organization, an healthy engineering organization and be on top of uh, quality control. So to, to control the quality of, of their outcome. But it is a large investment with with varying level of impact, and I say this because not all test flows are the same. Not all the not everything. Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, unit tests, sometimes it's much more much, make much uh, much more sense. But uh, sometimes to uh, to conduct a full end to end test would be very uh, very expensive in terms of, in terms of investment and limited in its ability to actually grasp the full potential of, of what can happen throughout uh, this end-to-end -end scenario and give false results. So it's a lot of investment. And if you haven't done it right, or if your problem space is too complicated, this investment would not necessarily pay off. Um, and I think this is why we can see in most mature organizations that they already have a large function in R&D, we can see also some layers of quality assurance uh, processes whether automated or manual, that um, that are the kind of mitigation control for for everything that was missed by the tests. So the tests are being compl complemented by quality assurance, manual or automated, which means that it's a little less uh, effective than if we compare it to another uh, activity that was shifted to the left, like a uh, containerization, where you don't expect the uh, people who were used to call the IT infrastructure or system infrastructure and are called DevOps, um, um, they don't. They are not expected to give attention to every new image that you publish or to every new Terraform configuration that a developer uh, is building or to a new Argo template. They, those things are built, are built with a framework and agreement between engineering teams and can scale up very easily. And all that the developer needs to do is to take responsibility for the activity of describing those elements of the code. Where in tests, they take full responsibility in building the, the code and sometimes even base their design flows with a, um, say something like TDD on, on the, uh, the notion of, of testing, but the results is usually still need some someone else's attention to make sure that it's uh, that it's proficient and that it's it's as at the point uh, that they wanted to. Um, we move into the next type of testing, which is 
shift left security testing, it become, becomes a little bit more dangerous because um, when when something when a bug slips by the tests and by QA and ends up to production um, and meets users uh, and come up through the channels of bug alerts, it is clear that that the developer who was built it there is a, a gap now and this is misfunctioning um, something is misfunctioning and you should get the attention. The the case of security is not the same because there is some gap between the validity of the report and the actual um, defect. So in many cases, and many of the uh, engines that are about producing alerts regarding security, so the part of code quality that is related to security, those engines are, are usually creating noise. Uh, and when this noise meet the developers, it jeopardizes one of the most important things in, in, in as from cyber security perspective, and it's your um, uh, cooperative relationship and the buy-ins of developers. In other terms, in more simple terms, if you pitch a problem, if you 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 pitch a problem that is that they it's not real and cannot be prioritized by developers as something that they really need to give attention to and you pitch it again and again and again automatically in large volumes, you most possibly end up losing the buy-in of developers and, and the, them having them, them saying to you, I don't care about this subject in general, um, which, which makes this approach dangerous a little bit. Um, so you could maybe get a lot of, of, of uh, reports, so counters of things that are probably problematic with your code base or even with your uh, running applications. But then to try as them and mitigate them will be a little bit more challenging um, to get this to a point that uh, the developers have, um, have agreed to fix the, the final backlog. And um, you don't really usually affect um, functionality. And it's many, many times, it's only just a, like a synthetic gate on your way to production. And, and when it's too synthetic, um, creators, makers will bypass it, will just go around it. Um, so on one hand, the effort that it requires for triaging um, to truly triage and, and introduce only true problems, like usually what comes from QA feed. QA feed will be real problems. This button doesn't doesn't really do, does what it's supposed to do. The pop-up doesn't show up. But in security, the feedback will be, there is a potential vulnerability reported by this tool. Um, but to full, to say, here is an exploit, it requ in, in many cases requires a lot of effort and, you, and there is not enough people to validate this and, and give you this kind of assurance. But on the other end, you cannot delegate it. So, so shift left is actually touching specifically this point. It's also about we don't have enough uh, um, um, system people. Let's try to scale up the way the way that we are uh, describing our infrastructure. That's one thing. But we also have situation where we don't have enough QA people or don't have enough. Um, uh, we don't want to invest too much in QA, so we want to bring more of the abilities of QA to the beginning of the of the um, to the to the left. But with security, it's more problematic because in many cases, the developers are not are not fully aware of the consequences of, of security defects. So you, it's one of the places where it's most appear, apparent is in, um, in questions revolving um, course. So just to explain course to a person, even, even if this person is developing a web solution, that just to explain course, and usually this explanation comes in the uh, in the setting of why did you enable course with uh, credentials to every domain uh, uh, that is out there, and then you go through an explanation that, of one hour on how course works. And frankly, even if they are very interested, they will forget forget it in in about a couple of weeks, two months, or, or a couple of months. And then next time it might make next time they might do it again because for them it's more crucial that their testing environment is working probably prior. Uh, Probably um, properly and and uh, and this slows them down, so they just enable this core setting. So in many cases, you we cannot shift left the triaging. We cannot. Uh, there is not enough knowledge and understanding of the problem. 
um, a lot of reports, uh, the numbers surely can easily antagonize an organization. Uh, and, and, and they cannot really prioritize this. And when you cannot easily prioritize something, you go into uh, lengthy discussions on priorities, which takes a lot of your time and usually also don't lead into something that is useful. So, so it's a lose-lose situation. You just keep a discussion and this could, could uh, look like a proof that this uh, SEA report is, is exploitable. I don't have the capacity to prove this, um, but you should solve it because maybe even if it's not exploitable today, um, it will be exploit uh, it, it will be exploitable tomorrow because tomorrow one of your developers will invoke the function that is vulnerable in this package, and then the response from the engineer would be, "We are very busy with things that happen today. We let's uh, worry for tomorrow. Tomorrow, and this is a very common discussion that we hear on the sidelines as we try to help uh, the teams build up a good relationship and and solve those problems, um, but." The, at, the, at the very at the bottom line is that the main thing that security teams are should be after the way personally I see it is the buy-in of their partners because eventually it's very rare that security teams are actually applying fixes. They're in they're instruction instructing and uh, prescribing fixes, but the person the people who are actually uh, applying the fixes are the engineers. And if you don't have their buy-in, um if if we don't have their buying, we we failed as a, as a, um, security teams. Yes. So so here one one of the things is also to make sure that there's a lot of there's a good feedback loop, right? So that you you can really understand, you know, what you want, but also the you can gamify this a little bit, right? So that mm -hmm. you know, like the teams can see, you know, when they do something, they can see quickly that hey, you know, you just made a difference, but also. There's nothing wrong with identifying, you know, which are the teams that are doing really well, which are the teams that sometimes are not as good, right? And also prioritize them so you have context in there, right? Exactly, exactly. And and I think that uh, this exactly leads me to my next slide when we talk about the things that we should be shifting left. Um, yeah. And and these things are about preparing and... and um, um, a, a right step in this direction would be to a little bit think of what would be the first smallest step to uh, bring this buy-in. Uh, by at the end of this buy-in, when the organization is fully committed, they will shift left everything and they will want ID level integration and um, commit on and checks on the commits and full CI CD integration. They will want and they will want to build it for themselves. But as application security, you cannot jump to this to the uh, to this last step of the way. You have to go through the steps, and the first easier steps is to focus more on attribution and more on 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 having them play with the concept of of so just um, in, instead of of enforcing the security controls directly start a discussion that is visible because it is done the, uh, the uh, coder's way with files in repositories that describe what needs to be done and that will start um, describing what the organization is going to do about application security, for example. So some, some building blocks of this would be that you need to think about it, that it only happens when they get the buy-in, when, when they decide it does, because even if you get a jurisdiction to run a bunch of tools tool in, on your, uh, in, in your CI, in your CI if if the end result, the, the user experience of the developers is not good enough, they will drop from this lane. They will bypass it and drop from it. It has to come with with when they decide it, it is time. Um, and you need to focus on things that uh, that um, benefits multiple groups. Uh, and I think that uh, one thing that shows here is, uh, for example, code owners is something that has a lot of uh, functionality across organization. You can use it for many different things. You can use it for measuring performance, but also for and uh, setting up the right channels for um, for dispatching messages when there is a problem, and then also giving access to some artifact if you did if you did it right and you're confident that you have the controls to manage it. So it it benefits a lot of uh, interest groups inside an engineering organization. And it's a good example because it's kind of simple and scalable in a way that uh, everybody can benefit from it. Um, and as you do this, as you um, 
as you think about the first thing that you should have your developers do, and it is not uh, automated testing. Um, the first thing you should have developers do, you, should, you need to think about how you can um, take from that and also uh, and get two of the, um, I, I'd say, most critical things that you need, which is the um, data or, or ability to report or ability to communicate um, things that are relevant both for developers and for their managers to reflect a picture that is relevant for the workflows of the developers, but also for the managers so they can later on um, increase the uh, investment on, on things that you're doing. Um, and shift left can really, really help you if you choose the, the right things to, um, to shift left uh, in the beginning. Um, so things that we can uh, start shifting left today. So the attribution is to push the adoption of patterns such as code owners as, as a security, as something that security has a stake in. Um, code owners is something that we need to give context, to, uh, to find what are, to, to give context, exactly like I said before. Um, and, and even take it, uh, you can take it to the next level uh, with starting to declare security facts and also maybe um, uh, information about uh, the security life cycle of the artifact. So I've seen teams uh, and actually been on a, OSS on a talk about uh, threat model as code. Uh, start build threat model concepts into, into code. So you would get the context, um, the visibility, and also the participation of developers as the first lighter step before we start answering some um, some questions that usually would lead to problems when it will be about this, the severity of this specific bug. You, you see a, a team of 10 people discussing the severity of a specific bug when when you know that the numbers in the scanners are like 10 times, 10,000 times larger and, and those people are crucial and their time is being wasted. So the one of the, uh, the things that you should be focusing in shift left on the first step at least would be to declare your security facts, to give context to the, the code to where developers are active. It can be, it can happen in your, in the natural manifests. Uh, so some manifests give you room for, um, some code manifest gives you room to declare this information. Like if we talk about the node package manager uh, manifest, there is a lot of room in there to declare it, or you can create your own file, or, or at least you should uh, stick to some basis that, uh, that are uh, already fully adapted, like code owners, it's very known, and, and adapt this as your first step, first tiny step in, uh, in shift left, and, and build on top of the ability to see a wide context, your future plans, where you can say, okay, the first citizens uh, in, the, in the entire inventory that are going to fully onboard in um, testing in uh, static uh, code analysis testing in CI would be those 10 artifacts because they said, that they need more help in security in their attribution. They said, this is a critical artifact. We want more, uh, we want class A security. And then when you come to them, they're already, they're already ready for it because they kind of ask for it in the way that they attributed their information about their artifacts. Just a quick one, on, on these code owners, this is code owners for security or code owners in general? Like who owns a particular bit of code? That's the first step. That will be the first step. If you that's, do- that's pattern right look like, I, I i don't agree I, I think we should do it but this is it's almost like we are helping the engineering process isn't it because one of the things that should happen in engineering is who actually owns what who owns what repository for example mm -hmm. so yeah so we have we we um we put our uh, efforts on on something that is is clearly their interest but we can get a lot of of this uh, very important context that we need and this is this is why this is a very good option to start with, because it clearly serves the needs of a, of R and D. And if your organization haven't already adapted it, um, helping them adapt something that is engineering. But you can um, I think we said in the beginning that uh, good security engineering is just simply good engineering. Um, yeah. but, you, but it's a bit it's a bit uh, rude to just come as an outside outstander and set this to the engineers directly. But say, okay, you know what? I have this. I need to be able to find people quicker. There's this code owner, and I see that we're not really using it. Maybe we can invest in, and here are a few, th a few more things that you can do when you have code owners. 
when you have proper code on as a cost organization. And then this is an investment that everybody can understand. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't bring a lot of discussion on priority and will be a very good step uh, in your whole shift left journey. Yeah, cool. Actually, just one more little thing. On this one, one of the things that's interesting is we, we have some projects and I've done some really cool stuff and there's actually some open security summit sessions around it of using um, config files in the repos. Mm -hmm. So this would be a great place to put that, right? Those owners where imagine each repo had actual mapping uh, for the Git repo, right? On what actually, uh, who owns it, what teams are responsible, what, who maintains it, et cetera, directly at the code, the code almost at the code level mm -hmm. that will give you that information, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's the code owner's pattern, uh, code owner's file pattern. And, and like I said, we've seen teams, um, that that uh, adapts it and also start to add security facts into it. So they do they put a little bit of the stride uh, or the uh, any threat model uh, result into those files, and then they can um, consolidate the information from those files. They put other security facts. They put uh, emergency Slack channel uh, information there uh, in relation to business unit or to um, or to revenue um, stream. So information that is, is is truly critical for security teams that that looks at a full picture to catch those important places and and uh, be effective in uh, in giving them the right attention yeah absolutely all right um so yeah i guess uh, is there any questions in the chat or any anything else that uh, people yeah i have a couple of questions on the appsec map right that yeah. you showed which is pretty awesome, right? I was looking at it. It's pretty cool. Um, Thank how you. do you save it, right? Like, where is the is this open source, by the way? This project? The project itself is not open source, but we will probably release it. We just uh you know we want to improve code quality before, but uh no, I'm kidding. Uh, we just uh the project itself is not is not open source yet, but um but the the data inside inside is open. So everybody can submit and everybody who submits after like just basic screening, just go inside and uh, is listed. Yeah, because it, this reminds me of that. I think was um, Tech Raider. You know, uh, you know that from um, um, who created it. You know, you know what I mean by Tech Raider. Does that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. From from uh, ThoughtWorks, right? Yeah. Uh, it's, um, because it's it's actually quite cool, right? Because it it allows you to visualize, right? A lot of the um the technologies right and i think this is really cool but but i think if you if you can open source this because for example i feel that for this to be useful i would need to create a, a fork of it so i can store the information right of of the the particular units in fact i i almost would like to have one of these just for for my security team because we now have engineering ca capacities mm -hmm. but also to have this created by for multiple teams mm -hmm. because if about it, like you know an organization of a distant size this already is going to be very hard to do this at organization level because yeah. every team is a little bit different yeah you know i mean so you almost want to have uh but you mean a, the, the the engine you mean the just the just a second just the engine itself that shows those uh target information with the search capabilities this is what you mean by outsourcing or the database well, we, you know, I, I kind of, when, when I look at something like this, I, I, I think of like a JSON file, right? Like there should be a JSON file that mm -hmm. contains all the data, right? Because this is not super complicated data, right? Um, that allows me to create the kind of maps that you were showing on the other side, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of visualization. So we start to get a sense of what we're using, what we're not using, what the things that we want to do, et cetera. Yeah. You know I mean, so, and yeah. then, and then, we, about this is you can even do threat models on top of this you can do all yeah. sorts of things and feed, feed other tools like you know like like you know your your the ones you guys have right but you you, you want a mode where people can maintain and create their own and and actually you know almost use this for all sorts of stuff because this is quite a nice way to visualize it yeah. right and you made it, you, you, you this is really cool but then the, the key would be to you know how can you even customize this or or save individual versions right so that i can share with the teams and then we can start to maintain it but i kind of view that you, you sort of want it in a case where it's the raw data should all be stored for example on the github repo so you can even version control that yeah 
So I'd love to have a follow-up session with you uh, to discuss uh, what can we do with it. How can we, um, you know, uh, align it to this to this idea, which I really like. In terms of tech, in technical terms, um, it's um, you know it's a React front end. The back end yeah. of the data is pulled from this this uh, submission tool, send it to uh, a Monday form, and we aggregate cool. the data and we and we just just qualify just a little bit because sometimes people submit one line yeah. per each uh, category and then we just qualify it a little bit and then we publish it to S3 so the stack is very lean and very like like you can see very quick so we can definitely think of a way to uh, yeah so if, um, if you think about it, like, open source know, sound of these abilities yeah uh, no but it's really I think it's cool because it also shows visually right, where you are I, 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 a lot of this is what I like about this is to show the maturity of the different systems and, mm -hmm. and where you are within an organization or where we are within the team yeah do you know what I mean so yeah. and even even the, the shifting left you can you know once you got this data you can start to visualize it right how far are you doing it how far is actually working etc yeah yeah definitely like if you think about your okay so you can you would do you would do um I asked and uh, so you do SAST and that would be your first block and then yeah. uh, so I do it with open source with mandate open source and then I get a little bit of progress on uh, on on uh, AppSec testing but then I go and I want to add, uh, so I will switch on this mode security WAF and I'll get progress in this and, and also have a generic uh, roadmap that talks about what should come before. Like code inventorying is a step that you take before you start the testing. So let's yeah. talk about what kind of code we have, what kind of artifacts, uh, we, uh, technologies we have. So yeah, we have, we're doing JavaScript, of course. How could you not? Uh, and then you're progressing on on creating this inventory, and all together is your roadmap into this. And I and I, I definitely I get that uh, people have different perspective on this, and the engine is quite flexible in showing a lot of things. So yeah, that's that's why I think you want to now foster a community, right? Because only I think there's a conversations that you can have from this that it only makes sense once it's easy and scalable, mm -hmm. right? Do I mean like for example, like I. And until, for example, I, I would be able to run this in an environment that I can create even a private versions of this, it doesn't make sense to me to involve the rest of the security team or even the developers, because that's the first question they're going to ask. Right? Where is the data going to be stored? How can we visualize this, et yeah. cetera? But this, this can be expanded really nicely, right, to even other domains, right? So it'd be really cool to start to, to have, for example, risk maturity levels mm -hmm. and other maturity levels that you can kind of map in the same way and then even apply color coding in terms of risks and in terms of things that you want to do um because one of the things you touched that i really like is the idea of core components mm -hmm. so and, and and also the idea of you know when, when we talk about you know shifting and accelerating in in one the worlds i live in is that the balance is almost like how do you strike a balance between the speed that the business wants to operate and the mm -hmm. freedom that's the part of the business wants to have and the security controls and the guardrails that you can put around it and so to empower them and also how can you align that with things that you would don't want them to reinvent the wheel so um the more core components you can have the more you know effective those you know sort of security things that we want to push on onto the teams become yeah. and yeah. actually you know the other thing that would be really cool is to zoom into this Right. So you can actually, you know, even on these areas, you know, like almost like let's say you double click on it, right? And you could see the 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 zoom in of that particular area, not in terms of this is to add, right? What I'm saying, what you actually see in there, right? Do you know what I mean? So basically imagine a world where, okay, so you got avatar, but like how well are you using it and what you're using it for? Or or some of the 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 I asked, let's say, start thinking about the coverage, right? Because yeah. it would be cool to also color code this based on adoption right based yeah. on all sorts of metrics that you can have on this it's not just the fact that you have it like sometimes it's easy to buy a tool but it's actually being used right yeah. you do do you actually have a tool you know being effectively adding results and picking up stuff right so it'd be cool to also measure the health of of this into yeah. here yeah so so you actually, I have, I have a, not a slide, but a branch in the code for the, for that, that actually has this, um, you know, when you click this add to map, you are, you're being sent to another form. And in this form, it, it, it tries to um, 
collect your perspective on how effective this solution is for your problem. Because then yeah. if, we, if you're properly populated with the information about the type of code that you have, and then, uh, I mean, in a, in a um, community sourcing approach of information, and you can say that, uh, that this um, SCA solution is the best or is, is adequate, at least for JavaScript, yeah. if a lot of people yeah. make this connection and attribute for it. Yeah. yeah, and imagine a world where you then can say, okay, we can, you can create an anonymized version of that. And then mm -hmm. that's the data that people could submit to. I think you should, I think you should give me a call and uh, we should, we should uh, have more, uh, more discussion about this and, uh, and some ideas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool. All right. I think, right. I don't think there's any questions here. So I think we're good, man. No, no, really, really cool session, man. So we'll, we'll probably so see much. you in a bit. And thanks for doing this. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.